Okay, now we are online. We are live streaming. First of all, welcome, Mr. Vesovic. It's, it's nice thank to you, have you. Thank you so here. much. Thank you so much for your kind invitation. Uh, you're welcome. As you know that uh, this meeting is supposed to be in Istanbul, uh, but due to the pandemic, we have to meet on Zoom. But uh, this is new normal, as you know, that we and we have to get used to this habit a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, so I just want you to, first of all, introduce yourself a little bit to our followers. Uh, well, thank you so much for your, uh, once again, thank you for your kind invitation. It's a, a privilege to be in a position to talk to you about the most important and challenging events in Montenegro in, in the region of the Western Balkans. I, uh, I live in uh, the capital of Montenegro, Podgorica, and I am a journalist uh, already for 15 years now in the most prominent Montenegrin daily newspaper, uh, which is a daily newspaper, Dan. It's the biggest newspaper in the country of Montenegro. So I've been covering mainly the international relations uh, uh, in the Balkans, uh, in the geopolitical and geostrategical context. Uh, also, the issues of the rule of law in Montenegro. As you know, Montenegro is a country that uh, is aspiring to join European Union, and the EU said that uh, basically Montenegro will have to fulfill certain criteria regarding rule of law issues, uh, and this has been most important uh, task in front of Montenegro in, 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 a, in, a, in a, for, for years already. So I've been covering a lot about uh, about that and also uh, the issues of the internal Montenegrin politics, uh, which I believe we will have the opportunity to, to discuss in a, in, a, in the next uh, 60 minutes. Uh, I hope that Montenegro is uh, perceived in Turkey as a um, country that is uh, bringing stability in the Balkans because, as you know, there are many different uh, communities living in this country and I think that uh, the fact that this was the only country in, in the former Yugoslavia that has not been that much involved in, in the war atrocities is very important as well. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. it's, it is quite important to, to raise the Montenegro as an issue in Turkish uh, yes. mainstream because uh, as far as I know, as far as I am dealing with the Balkans, Western Balkans, let's say, uh, we are always talking about Serbia, of course, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but when it comes to Montenegro, uh, this issue is not uh, covered enough uh, in Turkey. This is my opinion. So it's really good to have you here to, to talk about Montenegro and Montenegro and Turkey relations somehow, because uh, let me start with the uh, question regarding COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, yes. Marco, uh, as I followed that uh, there is no new case in Montenegro since 5th of May and slowly life became to turn normal again. And can you please tell us uh, how government of Montenegro managed, managed this process and how things are ongoing there? Uh, well, you're, you're right. Uh, lately, there has not been any new cases of COVID-19 in Montenegro. The um, situation with the pandemic uh, got better in May, before that, it was a bit difficult to, uh, to overcome that because, you know, this is a small country, but it's also a very important tourist destination and many people have come from abroad to visit Montenegro, even in the, uh, in the first months of this year. So that made it uh, exposed, so to say, to the uh, possibility of uh, bringing virus uh, in the country, especially as you know, the north of Italy, which was hit really hard with this coronavirus, was also very. It is also very close to Montenegro. So, honestly, you know, the the, the government basically thought that the situation could uh, get uh, worse uh, in 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 a month to come, but. The, um, the 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 whole thing was uh, done in a, in a in a good way. People of Montenegro, the citizens, were very disciplined. They followed mostly all the rules and procedures that were applied on the ground by the government of Montenegro. And uh, thank God for that. I mean, I'm, now we don't have any any new cases, and this is uh, one of the most successful stories when it comes to the. Uh, fight against COVID-19 because um, uh, for already more than 10 years, 10 days in a row, we do not have any new 
any new cases and the government decided to open uh, borders for visitors from a number of countries in Europe. Uh, so it should be uh, probably assumed that there will not be any problems with that, at least uh, uh, for, 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 for a summertime. But we'll see what happens in September, as you know. In Montenegro, the government, like elsewhere in the world, said that the second wave is likely to happen. So we'll see how will that uh, unfold and what kind of uh, events will that bring. But you know what we can say with certainty now: Montenegro is a uh, corona-free destination, destination in Europe. Uh, also, one other thing that is uh, very, very important. I mean, this has indeed shown how important it is to have a sustainable and strong health system. In, especially in the in the Balkan countries, this was a problem in, 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 in the last few decades. Many young educated people decided to leave the countries of the Western Balkans. They uh, the ones who were uh, trained or educated to be uh, doctors and to help to improve the, the medical system of the country. Uh, but in this COVID-19 situation, I mean, we also have seen much of a solidarity and we also have seen that health system in Montenegro, despite all the difficulties and problems that it's facing, is still able to preserve the health of the nation, which I think is very, very important achievement. So, I mean, it's a good news story when it comes to the uh, COVID-19, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is quite good news because yes. uh, we know in the Western Balkans, as you said, that the, the, the health systems, medical care is not that much developed, so yes. I, I really appreciate that the Montenegrins are very well disciplined, but I have to a little bit provocate you on this issue that, as you know, as we know that uh, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, in South Korea, that uh, COVID-19 spread it around with the religious gatherings. Yes. And as far as I know, that the, the Serbian Orthodox Church case in uh, Montenegro. Uh, yes. There were religious gatherings, funerals. So, what happened there? Uh, well, uh, okay. The, the, the part of discipline will also be attributed to the Serbian Orthodox Church as well, because you know it's a it's a good question and it's a one of the most important subjects in Montenegro and the Balkans as well. Uh, so, as you know, uh, since the the last December, uh, Montenegrin Parliament uh, adopted a law. Uh, the majority of members of the Montenegrin parliament, of course, not all, not all the political groups were uh, supporting that, M many were against, uh, decided to adopt a law which is very unique in the European, on the, even on the European level. I mean, you, you don't get to see that very often. Uh, Montenegrin government decided to uh, 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 give a certain time frame for a, a Serbian Orthodox Church to prove uh, that it has ownership over many monasteries and churches in the country, unless uh, the church uh, is willing to prove that, uh, then the government will seize these monasteries and churches, and that created a very huge political crisis in Montenegro, and many people were uh, gathering on the streets trying to, uh, to protest against this law and trying to convince the government that this should be done in a different way. Uh, the moment when these uh, gatherings took place, that was maybe January, and it was going on regularly until even March. And many of the world medias have also uh, put their spotlight on Montenegro because it is something interesting, obviously. The moment when the government said that COVID-19 is a real danger and that uh, the, there's a solid danger for the, for the health of the people, these uh, gatherings stopped. No funerals took place, no, no uh, weddings took place, no single uh, gatherings that would uh, endanger the life and health of the people took place, and the Serbian Orthodox Church stopped all the, all the, all, all the gatherings of the people until uh, Mar May the 12th, uh, when people, it's a huge religious holiday in Montenegro on May the 12th, and then people, uh, they come to get, came together in a few cities in Montenegro, and that was a bit of a, uh, problematic, but most of the time during the pandemic, no gatherings took place and church basically respected the measures imposed by the government of Montenegro. So uh, having in mind the better uh, situation now with the uh, epidemic, I assume that very soon the church and religious gatherings will take place again and then we will see people on the street. 
uh, it's a really complex subject and it would require uh, a, a, lot, a big amount of time for us to go through all that uh, from the beginning to the end because you know the issue of Serbian Orthodox Church is, 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 is really explosive for Montenegro. I mean this has to be done in a and analyzed in a very very careful way as you might imagine. Yeah, we will we will come back to this topic again, yes. but uh, I, I I would like to continue with the COVID nineteen issue. Yes. As far as I know, the alongside the many Balkan countries, uh, Turkey also sent medical equipment and the health assistance to the Montenegro. Yes. Uh, can you elaborate? Can you tell us? Uh, did uh, it was uh, on the media uh, how the Montenegrin people reacted towards that? And this is really important to, to hear from the first uh, hand to this. And also yeah, I yes. would like to add this, uh, except to Turkey, there were uh, assistance from uh, the EU countries or Russia. Uh, what happened yeah. with the international solidarity? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the help from Turkey was, uh, was uh, uh, presented in the Montenegrin media and Montenegrin public and it was, uh, uh, I think most of the people were really grateful and 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 and, and thankful for 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 uh, Turkey's support in this time in this really difficult time for uh, for for Montenegro. At least that was my experience. Not many countries decided to to bilaterally send help on, on a bilateral level to send help to to Montenegro. Uh, Russia was uh, was not among them, but that can be explained. Having in mind that the, the the political relations between Montenegro and Russia has not been very good lately, as you know, uh, Montenegrin membership to NATO and all uh, other aspects of that uh, situation that didn't really uh, help uh, Montenegro-Russia relations, and since the and especially Montenegro imposed sanctions on Russia uh, because of the Crimea crisis. Which obviously didn't help. So, so, so Russia, we can say that so Russia gave up from Montenegro. Well, Russia gave up from. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that, well, you know, I mean, it is, so it seems at this point, even though, even though, uh, in my opinion, uh, you know, th this is going to be a huge process because you know, in in historical terms, Russia was very close to Montenegro, so it's not. It's not really easy to say how the situation will, will unfold in a in a months or week or, or or years or even decades to come. Uh, that that remains an, as an open issue. But Russia didn't really put a lot of effort on Montenegro in, during the COVID crisis. Uh, Turkey was one of the countries that helped. Uh, <laughs> Serbia offered some support and help to Montenegro, but Montenegrin government, again from the political reasons, in my point of view, didn't really want to. Uh, put uh, much of an emphasis on that. So, uh, for example, Serbia was uh, offering medical supplies and Montenegro said, don't do that. I mean, this can be of some use to you since you're having also a large number of infected people. So, yeah, uh, I mean, that when it comes to the bilateral help, not, not like, like I said, not many countries were, were willing to, 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 to support because, you know, uh, everyone are in the same trouble. You know, the, the, the infection is a huge problem in, in, in all the countries. So I don't think there was much of a room for a help on a bilateral level. That's why I think the Turkish support was very warmly welcomed in Montenegro and it was received with a gratitude, and as for uh, international level, okay, well, you know, European Union, they, 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 at the beginning, they were really slow, as you might imagine, because, you know, some... Uh, uh, they are always like that, you know, when it comes to the Western Balkans. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, I've seen negative reactions in Italy, in some other major EU member states, Spain as well. So, I mean, obviously, Montenegro and the Western Balkans was not on top of the agenda, but then when they saw what they did, eventually they created a mechanism of support, which for, you know, for a specific case of Montenegro amounted up to 60 million euros of, uh, of financial assistance that will be given in a couple of phases, but the first one has already been provided. Uh, of course, uh, the ban on importing medical supplies, which existed in the beginning, was uh, canceled afterwards. That allowed Montenegro to import medical supplies from the EU, which was also very important, and then you know, I mean, things got fine eventually, but at the beginning it was a bit slow. Uh, United States, uh, they also had a bilateral donation to Montenegro. Uh, NATO didn't um, 
uh, contributed much uh, apart from uh, giving a possibility for uh, transportation of medical supplies mostly from China. But recently they said that they will probably be able to help uh, in the case of the to, to help more in the case of the second wave of pandemic. So we'll see what happens. But I mean, I think that people in Montenegro and government government are generally happy how the most of the countries decided to 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 to, to give support. You know, even though the support from uh, Serbia was not accepted, I still think that many people consider that this Serbian offer was a you know gentle way of of of, of, of supporting another country in a time of crisis. Ah, I see. Uh, okay, uh, Russia didn't use the, the 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 soft power as a tool in that really needed no. period. It's it's really interesting because uh, we know uh, not many years ago Russia was trying to interfere the relations. I mean the governmental relations in Montenegro. I even tried to to topple down the government as far as we know from the media. So it is quite interesting. I was expecting that, uh, okay, Russia tried, Russia tried to do that, but it happened like this. Interesting. Uh, let me let me tell you uh, how we perceive, not as general, but uh, in average mind of Turkish people, we, we, we really love Montenegro. I mean, we love Kotor, we love Budwa. That's really important for uh -huh. us and for the, the, the Montenegro, as you said, that it is it's, it's the, one of the top the tourist destination in the world, let's say, Budwa, Kotor, that are there. Even last summer I was there and I, it was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I can and, imagine. It's and, and when this pandemic started, I was thinking, oh, I hope it will finish soon and we can go to Balkans again because my parts, uh, my family parts uh, from there, I mean, I, 100 years ago, my family emigrated from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Why I'm right. telling this? Because I consider basically myself as a Bosnia. So yes. let me let me uh, ask you: uh, What about the Sanjak region in Montenegro? What about the Bosnia community in Montenegro? Uh, how they uh, experience that COVID nineteen process? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I. It's... Uh, like many other people in Montenegro, they were also faced with the same troubles and same dilemma, dilemmas. So, you know, it's, it's a disease, disease that knows not the borders or, or national or religious affiliations. So it's a problem for everyone. And, you know, I mean, like all other uh, citizens of Montenegro, the Bosnia community, in my view and my opinion, they were uh, also very, really uh, helpful in, and they show some discipline and the will to overcome the difficult situation that we all were faced with a couple of months ago. So as a result of that, now we are, at least in the government's view, corona-free destination, destination in Europe. So, uh, you know, it was not e easy to follow all the measures, especially because, you know, many people in the Sanjak region, they have relatives uh, in Serbia or in Bosnia, and they want to meet these people and they want to have a human contact. But it was not possible for, for some time, and it probably will not be possible for another short period of time, hopefully. And, you know, it's not easy to do that, to deal with it on a personal level, but, you know, you have to accept that, and which I think people did, and that was really a good story. And eventually, you know, every, everything came down to a, to a successful uh, situation. But, but, but they are very lucky that uh, since yeah. the 5th of May, uh, there is no any more cases in Montenegro, and as far as I remember, that from the fifteenth of May, the measures, May. yeah, We're start slowly, to be going down. Yeah, but the the recent development is that the border for Serbia and border for Bosnia and Herzegovina are not open yet. So... Yeah, it's it's a, it's really interesting. Borders for Croatia, borders for Greece and Albania are open, but why? Yes. Why not for Bosnia and Serbia? Well, what is the, the uh... logic behind that? Yeah, well, com coming back to the Russian issue, I mean, okay, so, you know, mo mo uh, the, polit the political mainstream in Montenegro, linked with government, perceives Serbia and Russia as the, well, quite a hostile forces now for Montenegro. But that's really controversial because I don't think many people in Montenegro will agree with that. 
and maybe in this in this regard there was a political decision on on behalf of Montenegrin government regarding border with Serbia but I can tell you that was a problem for ordinary people especially from Sanjar people from the reasons I explained before because you know you would need to have that border open so you can go and see your friends and, and family which is not very far away from you it's just in the other other for um, example on the other side of the having hill in, yeah. having in mind that we as uh, the muslims in the region they just uh, perform the aid for example <laughs> exactly the visits are very important for them visits are the very region. exactly but the, the, so well the, the official explanation and the official reasoning was well you know we had uh, new cases in serbia from the standards that are being uh, applied by the government of Montenegro, Serbia cannot still be considered to be a corona-free country. And also that, that, that goes with Bosnia as well. So that was the official explanation. It's like that for now. That is the situation at this point. Oof, will that change any anytime sooner? I hope so. And the officials in both countries today said that they believe that the border will be open very soon. Uh, I mean, it's, I would, as a citizen of Montenegro, I mean, I, I just wish that uh, there's, a, there's a common sense in all that and that uh, not the political forces will be behind any decision, but the common sense and uh, after all, uh, you know, uh, the, the clear feeling that this is a region where everyone needs to get together. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, though, as you know, I mean, European Union with all the troubles and all the problems that they are being faced now, they are still integrated and they are, you know, un un community. You know, Balkans is such a small place. You know, there is really no, no explanation but, why borders need to be so strict. Yeah, yeah, yeah but not, but you know that uh, the Balkans uh, uh, produce history than it consumes. You know, that yeah, there's that was, the same that was like that. Churches. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it is true, you know. Yeah. It, is, it, is. it is true. Uh, let's let's a little bit zoom into the region. I mean, we talked yes. about the, the international solidarity uh, regarding Turkey, Russia, United States of America. What about the regional sol solidarity? Okay, we understand that there is a there is not uh, a good relations now with Serbia and uh, Montenegro. But what about the Greece? What about Albania during the pandemic? What happened between these countries with Montenegro? Yeah, well, uh, on, I uh, I don't remember details exactly. I would need to look at that, but I know that both of these countries offered some bilateral assistance. I did interviews for my newspaper with the, the ambassadors of Greece and Albania, and they all said that uh, their respective countries were willing to help Montenegro deal with this issue, even though they recognize that it's not easy for them as well. As you know, it's a really difficult situation in these countries. But, you know, they offered help. And I think some of the donations from these countries arrived in Montenegro, in donations in medical supplies, especially when it comes to these masks for, uh, for people. Even today in Montenegro, you, uh, you, are, uh, you have to, uh, that's one of the decisions that is still in power. You have to have the mask if you're in, 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 a, in a public area, uh, even though we are a corona-free country. And these masks, they came from the donations of the of the region of the countries from the region, and it was a really important thing because there was a lack of them in Montenegro. I mean, nobody could have expected that uh, six months ago. So, really, countries from the region, having in mind their limited capacities, because they were dealing with the same issues like Montenegro, they tried to help as much as they can, and that's a good and positive uh, uh, the chain of events because. You know, uh, it's just to prove that even in in a difficult times when everyone are uh, faced with troubles, the that feeling of, of of solidarity in the region didn't really went away or didn't disappear, and that it's still present. So, you know, uh, apart from that uh, Serbo-Montenegrin situation, which is of course, in my opinion, more political than than because of the uh, uh, of the of the real problems. Uh, I would say that solidarity in the region we, has been shown. Yeah. Can we say that, uh, okay, the, the borders with Serbia is not open because of the political relations yes. with uh, governments, but can we say that what uh, with Bosnia, because of the Republika Srpska or 
to the Sarajevo government. <clears throat> it's really difficult. I mean, I, I don't know because if because, because the border, as you know, that, 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 that there are two entities. One small is RS, <laughs> and the big one. The borders with Montenegro are the, the, the territory of the RS. Yeah. That's why it comes to my mind. And also, we know that the the infected cases are the numbers are higher in arrest than uh, federation so yeah but if you're closing borders just because of the rs for example you're still closing borders even for uh, another entity so that doesn't really if you're why, why would somebody from sarajevo be punished and not allowed to come to montenegro if he wants to just because somebody in rs is politically not affiliated with the montenegrin government i mean it's if this is the reasoning behind the policy of the Montenegrin government, then I, I would say it's, it's, it's horrific. I mean, uh, because uh, this, uh, as, even though I understand that maybe there are concerns about the situation in Bosnia in general, not just in RS, but also in Serbia as well, I understand that. And I mean, I can, I can imagine that maybe they're, they're afraid that there will be many, maybe they will open uh, space for some new cases of COVID-19 in Montenegro. Uh, you know, it's, really not a good idea to 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 make political decisions to close borders i mean it's but, uh, really, but yeah. from the media from the media that i followed the the, the first reactions towards that uh, not opening border with bosnia and serbia came We're, through the, the ivica dacic and from the rs part of bosnia rather than sarajevo <laughs> you know yeah, you know yeah, we're I, at Bodic and it's uh, i know i know i know but but you know it's i i think that did they uh, having in mind the previous political conflicts in the region and the fact that explanation of the Montenegrin government didn't sound very convincing? I mean, the fear of new cases coming from these areas. I mean, this is a, why would they come from that country, from Serbia and not from Germany? I mean, we open border for Germany and you know, yeah. Germany has a many new cases and so I don't, I don't remember figures now, but I'm, I'm sure they're really not that great uh, 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 and then i mean you know there's a political reasoning behind it so and like i said many people in especially in the northern part of montenegro they are prevented from flowing in 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 in, in the countries like bosnia and serbia and that, that's just not really a wonderful situation and you know yeah well do maybe some of the reactions from serbia and republic of srpska were they great okay well we can talk about it maybe they were not so uh, uh, diplomatic and maybe the language was not very uh, one of the best things we, we can hear in media but well you know i mean in the end of the day they have some things to say and they can maybe probably say that you know uh, the montenegrin government let, should we, let, uh, let me relate this issue a little bit with the forthcoming elections in montenegro yes. because yeah. in, in 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 the coming october there will be elections parliamentary elections in montenegro yes. if nothing will change because of yeah. the certain waves or not let's see but uh, as I know, uh, the Bosnia community, uh, their political party are in the government with the governing political party of Montenegro. Yes. They are together, they are in a coalition. So, and as you said that the, the, the Northern part of the country, people are not happy with this, uh, the restrictions between Serbia and the Bosnia. So basically uh, you are not making happy you, you, do, yeah. you don't let people to be happy you are with in government. Yeah, well, but this is, okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, I mean, the major and the most important political group of the Bosnian people in Montenegro is affiliated with the Montenegrin government. But there are other Bosniak politicians in Montenegro. Okay, I, 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 don't, I would agree that they're not very popular. And I mean, they don't have maybe in this, in this time and in this point, they don't maybe have much of a, 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 a political power in Montenegro, but they are also very critical uh, on the on the, the on the Montenegrin government. Uh, I because I've been following local politics for more than a decade. I remember that even this Bosnia party, the one that is now in the government, was also sometimes in, uh, critical on, on the on the rule of the Montenegrin government. And let me let me explain this. I mean. This is very interesting fact. Montenegro is the only country in Europe that didn't change government since the fall of the Berlin Wall. So yeah, it, is, it is quite interesting. That is very interesting. <laughs> this is Montenegrin's very specific situation in Montenegro. Uh, the reformed communists who created Democratic Socialist Party uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, they won the elections. 
and they were uh, uh, affiliated with the regime of Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia. But then the current Montenegrin president, Djukanovic, who was also an ally of Milosevic, he decided to uh, withdrew his support for Serbia and Milosevic in 1997 and uh, cut off his ties with, uh, with, 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 with Serbia and Milosevic. And he was able to, uh, you know, divert Montenegro in a different direction, so to say, thinking about the independence, which eventually happened in 2006 and you know eu and nato membership so uh, uh basically uh, having that in mind same political group in power for three decades you would need to really rethink about the whole situation in the country i mean okay yeah well bosniaks they, they have their own uh, interests they want to be integrated into montenegrin society and they want to have uh, as much as uh, uh, access to the public services uh, to basically have their position according to the number of people that they have living in Montenegro. So, I mean, that, I understand the logic behind the, the, this. Uh, Bas basically, we can say that Bosniaks in uh, Montenegro are better in better conditions than the Bosniaks in Serbia. I mean, in two Sanjaks, when we compare. Well, you know, they, they well... They because it seems there. like that to us. This is my opinion, what I see from well, here. I don't know. Well, I, I mean, I've seen made some negative reactions in Montenegro as well. I mean, I, it's difficult for me to say that maybe they are in better position in Montenegro. I mean, that that would need to be uh, analyzed in details. I know that in Serbia they have uh, a very prominent government official who is keep on telling, at least here in in the local public, that Bosniaks are better every day in Serbia. Uh, in Montenegro, they did not have the permanent uh, pres presence in the government before 2012. After parliamentary elections in 2012, the Bosniak party became the integ integral part of the ruling coalition. And uh, over the years, they were able to uh, basically get more political and economic power in Montenegro. And now I think they are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a good situation. In general, are they in a great position? Well, certainly not. I mean, the situation. I, I, I think the 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 the, the ministers, the, the 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 vice president of the Montenegrin government from the Bosnia party, they would say that okay, situation is better than it was ten years ago, but it's still not ideal. I mean, we will work and try to uh, to work to work for that uh, for for a better. I mean, yeah. Oh, this, again, it's difficult to compare the situation between Serbia and Montenegro. Yeah, because you have to know, and Montenegro is much smaller. This is a really small country with only 625,000 people living here on a permanent basis. So it's easier to basically maybe resolve some issues with, with the position of national minorities uh, than maybe in Serbia, which is a much bigger country. They obviously have 7 million people living there, according to the last estimates. And not only um, is an issue with the Bosniak minority, because we also have here uh, an Albanian minority as well, although they are much smaller than the Bosniak minority, but they still have their own permanent presence in the Montenegrin government. And we also have Croats. They are the smallest of all national minorities, but you know, uh, I think that uh, basically they, uh, they, they are in a better situation you know, than they were 10, 10 years ago, all of them, I think, which I think is a positive development. Uh, you, you open a really interesting issue, uh, yes. Marco. Uh, you said that uh, for two decades, the, the, the same party ruling the country, the same government ruling Montenegro. Yes. But, yes. but there is uh, interesting another uh, fact. I mean, Montenegro became the, the, the 29th of member of the NATO on June yes. 2017. And yes. now, as we know, that front runner for the EU accession process in the region. Uh, and... But, but, there is a big contradiction. The recent, the late uh, Freedom House report, probably exactly. you know about it. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's telling that Montenegro is a hybrid regime rather than a democracy. It is there a is a government which is uh, putting Montenegro on the path of Europe and Atlantic, but there is a report, it's not a democracy anymore. So. Yeah. The, the, uh, that, uh, you, you can imagine that me as somebody who's living here in this country and follow, I, I've been very critical on the, on the situation in Montenegro in certain aspects, 
and uh, the government of Montenegro deserves to be criticized because of some of the uh, uh, of the things that were being done in the last couple of decades. Uh, the level of democracy in Montenegro is not that great, even though we have to agree that what we just discussed, the presence of the national minorities in the coalition government is a very positive step. Okay, so, I mean, in the end of the day, you cannot say that not uh, that all the things that were done were wrong. I mean, there were some positive developments. But in general, I think the Freedom House report is giving quite a fair overview of the situation in this country. NATO membership per se is not something that can be considered as a huge democratic achievement. Some of the countries that joined NATO before Montenegro were also not very, very, very uh, high on the agenda of the European Union. For example, Albania became member of NATO uh, before Montenegro. And when it comes to the EU membership, they are still very, very far away from, from the EU membership. Mon Montenegro, uh, this is also some of the issues that needs to be raised here, is negotiating with the European Union for eight years already. The accession negotiations with Montenegro were open in June in, two, uh, in June of 2012. Now yeah. we are here almost in June 2020, and not all the chapters are open with Montenegro. One, one, of, one very important chapter, chapter 8, which is about competition, has not even been opened yet, which means that we are uh, dragging these negotiations for eight years, and nobody can tell you with certainty how long will that take until this is to be completed. So there has to be some sort of a democratic change in Montenegro. How will that happen? That is difficult to say, because I understand that, the, that, that NATO and the European Union are afraid of the Russian influence, and you need to have a balance between escaping and avoiding this Russian influence on one side, and on the other side, making this country democracy that works. So it's a really difficult challenge, and I, I mean, I know that it's not easy to do that, but something Something has to be done. And you mentioned elections in, in October this year. That will probably happen in October. This is going to be a really, really big political event in this country. And it's going to be, uh, I think, very important for the region in general, because this will be a huge challenge for the Montenegrin government to politically survive. Because I think that they are on, a, even though this COVID-19 did gave the government some praise and, and you know the government might be uh, in some way considered to be successful in dealing with this crisis in the end of the day in my fair opinion is that the support for montenegrin government is not on a really really big uh, score right now and what, what were... about the opposition democratic montenegro party yes are they doing well uh, okay so there are <laughs> opposition opposition that is close to serbia and russia which is very, yeah, that's that's why I'm asking, basically. Yeah. Uh, that, that, but that, that is uh, okay in a democracy. You, if you want to uh, support this position, that that's that's fair decision to make. I mean, they, that's up to them. Uh, but the the figures for them are also not very great. I mean, you know, because uh, having in mind that NATO is finished story. I mean, it's not 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 easy now to deal with the, this situation i mean okay so montenegro is a nato member and then that's it i mean you, you have to deal with that uh when it comes to the another segment of the opposition in montenegro now this is very important are there uh political groups who are uh supporting uh, eu and nato membership and they are against the current government they are there are some political groups are they strong enough to 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 to, to just uh, you know, uh, get enough support in the next elections, well, that's an open issue. It's difficult to say at this point. Probably the, uh, coming up to the elections, we'll probably have better figures and we'll see. When, when you mention political groups, uh, do, you, yeah. do you, can you give us a name of a political party or still there are groups? Are there no, established? Well, you know, okay, so, so for example, the, the country, the parties that are affiliated with Russia and, uh, and Serbia, I mean, affiliated, supporting of, of Russia and Serbia, that's basically coalition called Democratic Front. They are okay. the biggest opposition, they are the biggest opposition group in Montenegro. Uh, they, I think they have 20 members, and they are basically saying that, Mont they are, think, say, basically, they were um, uh, the, 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 the most of these political groups. Uh, forming that coalition were supporting joint state between Serbia and Montenegro in 2006. Uh, they are the biggest opposition group. Uh, there's another one called Socialist People's Party, 
uh, it's also a, a political group that was uh, supporting the federation between Serbia and Montenegro. They are also very strong, but uh, there is also a democratic Montenegro. This is a new, polit a relatively new political group. They've, they've been uh, formed in 2015, and I think that uh, they are in the situation also to have a good result in the uh, elections in October. Social Democrats, Social Democratic Party, they are uh, pro-EU, pro-NATO pro membership, and they are against the government. They also are, I think, in a situation to do something serious. Uh, who else? I mean, these are four political groups which are uh, uh, present. And there is another one. Uh, this is called uh, the Civic Movement for, uh, for Reforms. This is uh, also another pro-EU and pro-NATO political group, and they are also against the government. They, I think, are also in the position to have the, uh, the good results. So combining all that together, I mean, the, the result of all the opposition groups, regardless of their uh, political affiliations, maybe, I mean, maybe this will be a result that will change Montenegro. I mean, because so obviously- the next elections will be yeah. a big challenge for the President Djukanovic. Exactly, what we said before. But, uh, you know, uh, to have a peaceful and democratic change of power after three decades, because Djukanovic came to be a Prime Minister of Montenegro in 1991. I mean, this is really long time ago, so... It's, yeah. it's quite interesting. Here in it's, Turkey, we have the same government almost two decades as well. Yeah, but this is three decades. I mean, this is from 1991 until 2020. I mean, this is just really unusual case. I mean, this makes Montenegro very unique. So, I mean, you have to have some understanding for the desire of the local people in Montenegro to change something. I mean, uh, without any- probably any, Probably one generation just grow up, raised up with the same people. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that, that, that's not really, uh, I mean, as a, as a journalist, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a somebody who's, I mean, feeling that democracy is, is, is really a, a great human achievement, I mean, you would have to think that, okay, the, the, you, you've been in power for three decades and I mean, I'm surely you're not thinking of spending another three decades. I mean, that... <laughs> it, it seems like uh, I just remember the, the, the campaign of Barack Obama. Uh, yeah. So we believe in change. In yes, we believe. That is, <laughs> we hope so. Yeah, it sounds very nice. But, you know, in the history of this region, uh, rulers were running countries uh, for a long period of time, for example, for example, the late King Nicolaus, he ruled uh, more Montenegro more than five decades. And in the communist Yugoslavia, the president Tito ruled Yugoslavia for more than three decades. So, okay, I, I mean, this, his, this, this every part of Europe has a history with the leaders running countries for a long period of time. So that's apparently something that is very known here. But I mean, if you want to be a member of a civilized Europe and if you want to uh, have a democracy, I mean, you would have to have a change of government in the peaceful and, and free elections. That, that's my, my conclusion. I, I fully agree with that. I fully agree with that. Uh, we, have to, we have to take care of the, the, the democratic process and the exactly. democratic gains that we have uh, in, 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 in difficult times, I mean. Yeah. So, uh, we, we already talked about uh, the, the, the Russia uh, as a threat in the Montenegro and the wider Balkans. But what about China? Uh, we know that uh, the China uh, is doing very well with Serbia and uh, somehow it's even accelerating the European Union towards the Western Balkans somehow. Yes. Because they perceive it as a threat. What about the, in Montenegro? What's Chinese influence there? Well, you know, it's a really, really important question. Uh, I was in China last year and we were able to talk to the representatives of the Chinese government about situation in the Balkans. And I mean, you could just tell from these discussions that they have a long, that they have a plan to have a long term presence in the in the region of the Balkans. I mean, do they have any political agenda? That is really difficult to say. I mean, when you ask these questions, they will tell you, okay, well, this, this part of Europe is very much uh, uh, distant from us in terms of, you know, it's a very different part of the world. So, I mean, what kind of a political agenda can we have there? But we definitely have a, a financial and, and economic agenda in the region of the Western Balkans. 
So uh, in Montenegro, they did something really, really, really strange. I mean, it's not something you get to see that every day. You know, this country has a major infrastructural problems in the last few, few decades. Uh, not a single meter of the highway has ever been built in Montenegro. And uh, uh, the idea was to have a highway that will link north and, uh, and central and southern part of Montenegro. That will be a huge economic step forward to have basically connect the whole government, the whole, the whole country will be transformed and this will be a major infrastructural challenge, uh, step forward for Montenegrin government. Uh, of course, when calculating how much money would you need, uh, the first calculation was that it will take more than 1 billion euros to finalize everything. No Western uh, creditor was interested in financing that. And uh, the Russians, even if they would uh, be willing to do that, they were already on a wrong foot with Montenegrin government, so they were out of the picture anyway. And uh, that left China as the only uh, lender that will probably help Montenegro, and that, that was the case. The Chinese bank gave loan to Montenegro. The Chinese company decided to engage in creating this, in constructing this highway. With this construction is still taking place, it will probably be over in a, in a, the first uh, part of the highway will be over in a, maybe a year or so. Uh, when they enter Montenegro and they decided to uh, to to, sp to spread their influence around, the EU got uh, nervous and concerned that we could see here on the ground in Montenegro. The, e the, the former EU enlargement commissioner, Johannes Hahn, said that, you know, the Chinese is something that we need to to look uh, very closely in Montenegro, but I don't. Be, I mean, it's my opinion. I, I don't. I don't see any political agenda agenda in what they do. Of, of course, this huge loan that was given to Montenegro that's something really, 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 really interesting. Uh, Montenegro can get into some serious financial trouble because of this uh, loan from the Chinese bank. If you don't pay your uh, that that's in time. That would be a big problem for Montenegro, in my opinion. But I mean, is there any political logic behind that? In, in Montenegro, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know about other countries, but in Montenegro, I mean, I, it's difficult to say that at this point. Uh, what, what I, as a citizen, what I like to, what I would like to know is that uh, how this agreement was reached with the Chinese bank, and what are the terms of this loan? Because uh, we are concerned, and not everything has been told the. To the public here in Montenegro, what's the agreement between Montenegrin government and the Chinese bank and the Chinese company? So, the, from from everything I said, you probably can imagine that there are many open issues. There are many reasons why why people in Montenegro should be concerned in the first place. And then, you know, EU. Well, you know, you you could have prevented that. I mean, you could say, okay, we don't want Chinese presence in Montenegro, and that's one of the conditions for for your membership. Well, they didn't say that. I mean, so. And we know that in, even in some EU member states, Chinese are doing something really big, like in Croatia, they're building this bridge. You probably know about that. So, you know, I mean... Wherever, wherever these Chinese influence yes. are, uh, I mean, as discussed as an issue, yes. uh, almost all people are telling that uh, when you talk with Chinese people, they say that we don't have any political agenda. Yeah, it's, it's, it's no, quite that, interesting. I mean, it's a it's a standard line. And do, do they have any presence in Turkey? I mean, do they have also have some strong infrastructural project there? Uh, yes, I can say uh, Turkey. Uh, the Turkish government is uh, trying to engage with China in some ways. Uh, recently, let's say four or five months ago, I attended one uh, conference, which is a road and belt initiative. You know yes. the, the, the the very well known uh, project of Chinese people, and it was backed by the Minister of uh, Treasury and Finance in Turkey, for example. So I'm not that much interested with this issue, but as far as I know, that uh, we uh, as a Turkey in foreign policy somehow trying to to to, to deal with China as well, not only with uh, Russia, but uh, the China is uh, another actor in our foreign policy. Yes, yes. Well, you know, it's the same in Montenegro. Yeah. But uh, but nobody knows what the what Chinese want. <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> that is an open. That is an issue. It is. I mean, that, that's I was I, got, I yeah. was really amazed when I was uh, last time in Belgrade. Uh, from Nikola Tesla, you started to see the Chinese influence very well. I mean, yes. there is a big uh, buildings, Hawaii, and everything around. 
and even on the Knez Mihailov on the main street, you know, Belgrade. Yes, uh, I there were many Chinese around, so it is quite interesting. <laughs> it is quite interesting. I mean, the official explanation is that it's helping economic growth of Serbia and the Chinese uh, donation was very important uh, uh, in, during the COVID-19 crisis in Serbia. I forgot to mention, and I think it's also very important, the Chinese also made a donation to Montenegro as well during the oh. COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, that's uh, something I forgot to, to mention, but it's also a very important subject. In, you're right, nobody knows what the Chinese people want. They are also very present in Montenegro in, in every day's life. You get to see many, uh, you know, many Chinese people on the streets. So, you know, I mean, it's something that is happening, but it's really difficult to say what's happening in, in, in this moment, in this, in this time here in Montenegro. I mean, okay, you, you know, maybe this line, they don't have any political agenda sounds a bit boring because they keep on mentioning that, but I mean, it's difficult to say what kind of a political agenda would that be in a, in a country like Montenegro. I mean, it's a small country. We, we don't, they already made some important foreign policy decisions. So, you know, it's a, not easy to see whether there is any political agenda here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as I see, the time is almost uh, done. Uh, sorry, yes. for my dog is barking. I have no, a dog. Worry, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sorry for interruption. Uh, but the, the, the last question, uh, yes. the, the, the people who are working on security and the intelligence issues are really uh, curious about who is Mohamed Dahlan and what's relations with Montenegro. Yeah. This is really important because you know Mohamed Dahlan is the list of the wanted people in Turkey, Turkish intelligence agency. So as a Montenegrin citizen and journalist living in Podgorica, please tell us uh, what is relations with Dahlan and Montenegro. Uh, that's and also, really... please give us some information about Dahlan as well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, well, this is, I know that Dahlan is a very interesting uh, person in Turkey because that has been reported here that he's wanted by the Turkish authorities. Okay, uh, this is really interesting subject and it's very interesting uh, to, to, to talk about him because um, back in 2010, uh, Dahlan was given uh, the citizenship of Montenegro. Uh, the president of Montenegro, Djukanovic, the one that has been in power for three decades, he has been, uh, uh, he decided to award him with the citizenship of Montenegro. And the official explanation is that he's really, really uh, helpful when it comes to the investments from the Middle East, especially if you're from United Arab Emirates. So he came here, set up a few companies. That comp those two companies didn't do quite a good job in Montenegro. They all went bankrupt. Uh, uh, unofficially, what you can hear here in Montenegro, he uh, connected the leadership of Montenegro with the royal family of Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and he made possible some investments from Abu Dhabi in Montenegro. Uh, okay, these are not huge investments, but I mean, okay, a couple of hundred of million, a couple of hundreds of millions of dollars, probably. That's how much money came from Emirates to Montenegro officially. Uh, and uh, in 2013, he said, suddenly appeared in Serbia, doing the same thing like he did in Montenegro, bringing yeah. investors from the Middle East. So, I mean, that, that he also received the Serbian citizenship, and he was presented there as basically somebody that can help S Serbian economy to grow and to open the market of the Middle East for Serbian companies. That didn't work when, when, well, anyway, I mean, in Serbia, he was not really very successful, like he was not very successful in Montenegro. I mean, we as a journalist, we didn't saw any, any uh, re reason why would he receive Montenegrin citizenship, especially because, as you are probably very well familiar with, with this, he was named as a suspect in many criminal cases around the world. And he was even accused for uh, war crimes in, 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 in Yemen recently and in, in Libya in one point in time. So these are some really dodgy people. And if you want to have a, you know, Montenegro that is <laughs> joining European Union, you would not give citizenship to these kind of people. I mean, that was the only, uh, that was something we had in mind when we were asking questions. Why did he receive the Montenegrin citizenship? That, it's really a strong subject. Did he use Montenegro as a base for some of his activities, including the ones in Turkey? It's not easy to prove that. There are no any proofs for that right now that I can give you. 
But what I've heard recently in the last few years, among, other, among others, based on the Turkish uh, request, he was uh, excluded from the Balkans. So he basically did not came here to Serbia or Montenegro in the last few years. That's what I've received an info here in Montenegro, and I think it's a solid one. He's basically set up a base in Arab Emirates, and he's been operating from there most of the time. So, I mean, what did he try to do here in Serbia and Montenegro? Maybe to launder money that is acquired through some criminal activities. I mean, that would seem like a logical explanation. I don't have any proof for that, but that just seems like a logical explanation. We'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that in, in, the, in, the, in the months or years to come, there will be documents and evidence emerging about his presence in Montenegro, even though it was more 10 years ago, and, and even though it's not something that is happening now, but I still think it's going to be very interesting to see what did they try to pull here in, in Montenegro. Uh, Marco. Mr. Vesovic, thank you very much. I don't know. I don't know if it is correct or not. Hvala <laughs> puno. That's a good sentence. <laughs> That's how we would say it. Yeah. Uh, it was it was really nice to have you here. I mean, uh, we talked many different issues regarding Montenegro, yeah. the Western Balkans, EU, Russia, influence in the Balkans, except the COVID-19 pandemic. So I, I just want to get a promise from you to before the elections, we have to make it again uh, that, or maybe sooner. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe sooner. Uh, let's keep that cooperation. It is really nice. It's really good to uh, get the information from you. Thanks a lot. Uh, so Thank you. let me let me finish live streaming. Then I will say you goodbye. No worries. <laughs>